Good evening. All right. Wasn't kids seem good tonight? Especially good tonight. Quite a few visitors and big crowd, kids seem crowd. You gotta like that. I'm proud of all the kids singers, uh, every one of them, for medals and various awards that they take home because of their efforts. And uh, you know that'll that'll pay off in good fruit down through the years. You've got to believe that. Of course, our gospel meeting's coming up pretty quickly. Uh, David Light scheduled to be here, and if you uh, see these bookmarks in the songbooks in front of you. Uh, they're there for you to use, so feel free to pull them out of the songbooks, take them home with you. They're a reminder of the dates of our meeting, September 12th through the 15th, and you keep these, so make use of them. And um, uh, the, the announcements that are on the table out in the foyer, be sure to get those too. If there's any way that you can uh, utilize them, pass them out, uh, to others. I think you're really going to um, enjoy Brother Leip. If you remember when he was here for a seminar a few years ago, then you know what kind of a person he is. But leading up to our meeting, uh, I've been able to talk with him a little bit on the phone and gotten to know him a little more. Uh, my association with him is basically uh, has been by knowing him at Freed Hardeman, seeing him direct the lectureship uh, for so long a time. He directed the lectures from 1993 till 2015 when he retired as uh, director. And then he went to what used to be East Tennessee School of Preaching and Missions. It's been renamed since then and I don't recall the name. But David Leip is um, <coughs> He's extremely uh, energetic. Uh, he's from Mississippi, and he will, he'll remind you that he's from Mississippi. He has a Ph.D. degree, but he's just as down to earth as anybody you will ever meet. And I like to think that Brother Life is just as, he's as country as cornbread and chicken, and that's the way I think of him. Uh, he's just that kind of a guy. He is really looking forward to this meeting. Uh, he had a meeting, he does about 10 or 12 meetings a year, so he's very busy doing this. He speaks on lectureships. Uh, he's quite active and very busy in that regard. So we're blessed to have him coming, looking forward to it, be here very quickly. So be sure to take home these reminders uh, of the meeting. Tonight I'm going to go to um, Philippians, the third chapter. I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to um, Philippians 3, 13 and 14. This is a passage that very often uh, we will use for... New Year's thoughts. I like it as a New Year's sermon because it helps us to, you know, think about what's ahead. I'm going to tonight take it in the opposite direction somewhat, and I want to use it to help us look back a little bit. You'll notice that the PowerPoint behind me tonight will be almost nothing, and the sermon is not far behind. The PowerPoint will be just one, two slides, and that's as short as you can make it. So all you need to do is keep your Bible open to Philippians 3, 13, and 14, and then just connect with what it says and follow me for just a little while. You don't have to live very long to realize 
however long you live on this earth, you want to come to the end of it without any serious regrets. If you have any sense at all, if you have any kind of proper upbringing at all, then however you may process that, you want to come to the end of your years, whether it be short, whether it be long, and be able to look back without any serious regrets. Now, we all have regrets of one kind or another. I understand that. On the other hand, there are serious regrets that you have in life. And as, as Peter expressed it in 1 Peter 3 and verse 10, if you would love life and see good days, then refrain your tongue from speaking evil and your lips that they speak no guile. I doubt that there's a person living that in whatever way they may process it, wants to see good in their life without looking back and having regrets about what they've done. But then, you know, life happens to people. Things happen. And you find yourself in situations that you never imagined. Things you never dreamed of. And yet, at the same time, there's a way out of all of that. I have to think, as I'm going through this with you tonight, yes, we want to avoid serious regrets when we get older. We don't want to come to the end of life and bow our gray heads down in sorrow. Genesis 38 and verse 42, we don't, we don't want that. We want to be able to look up, hold up, hold our head up high. We want to be able to look people in the eye. We want to be able to smile. We want to look forward to a good future. We want to anticipate eternity with God in heaven. If we come to the end of our years, as we're getting older and we have regrets and we look back and wish we'd done things differently. I'm going to underscore this lesson tonight with one thing, that God's mercy is always there and His grace is never to be forgotten. And that even if we do come to the end with, with serious regrets, you know, His grace is still powerful enough to cover me. If I'm obedient to Him, I cannot forget His grace. I will not, under, I will not understate the importance of that. At the same time, I realize that we're like Paul here in Philippians chapter 3. We, we're running a race, and we're not finished with it yet. And once in a while, we will look back, and we will try to process where we've been. And we will say, woulda, shoulda, coulda. And that's the language of regret. And the regretters that talk that way go all the way back to Adam. So here we are tonight. And in a sense, we're sitting here and we're looking back and we say to ourselves, you know, I'm glad that I'm here tonight. I'm happy for the Sunday night association that I have with these wonderful Sunday night saints who love one another and who love to visit and fellowship, love to worship. And yet we look back in our own private world and we say, well, you know, there are so many things I wish I had done differently. There are so many questions, 
still hanging over my head? What if I had done this differently? What if I had not said this? What if I had said that? What if I had not done this? What if I had done that? What if I had married somebody different? What if, what if, what if? The language of regret, you see. And it sticks with you and it hurts. And it never lets you go. It's like a barracuda. It won't turn loose. You know, one thing that we'll never regret in life is doing the will of God. In Galatians 5 and verse 23, when Paul covered the works of the flesh and then the fruits of the Spirit, and at the end of it, regarding the fruit of the Spirit, he said, and against such there is no law. In other words, you'll spend your life living according to the fruit of the Spirit, and you will never regret it. You'll never have cause to regret it. So I can take some comfort in that and realize, you know, yeah, I, that's a pattern and a path that I, I can follow and, and I don't have to bow my gray head down in sorrow. Again, Genesis 42, 38, I think it is. And I don't have to wallow in, in sorrow at the end of it all. In Philippians uh, 3, 13 and 14, Paul does a few things here. And again, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm looking forward with the passage, but I'm going to look back too. Because looking back, that's where the regrets are. They're always back there. But look what Paul does here in Philippians 3, 13. And as we open our thoughts here, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. And I use this thought to suggest to you that uh, Paul is not alone in this. And he's reaching out to the church at Ephesus, or Philippi, I'm sorry, and he's inviting these brethren to join in with him in this thought that I do not count myself to have yet apprehended. In other words, even as an apostle, Paul felt like, or it seemed to feel like, at least in the way I read this, that he has not yet accomplished all that he needs to accomplish. And I suspect that every person here could say the same thing tonight. You have much more that you want to do. So in that regard, you are of course, looking ahead. And so he asked these brethren at Philippi, please to join him in this. That's what his quest is. Let's lock arms together in this quest. And we're not alone in this. And I know that everybody has their own story. You have your own story of what's happened to you and regrets that you may be harboring in your heart. I understand that. But in, in, in spite of it all, please remember that there are others who have been there and done that. There are people who have cause to regret things in life. And sometimes, and, and I know Christians who have been years away from the Lord and they have done things they regret, but they're back now. And they're trying to overcome years of mistakes and misdeeds and sin. They're trying to turn things around. And they've come back because they don't want to be alone in this quest. They need help and we need to support one another. But whatever you see as you look back in your life and whatever regrets there may be, please realize that your story is not the only one. There are other stories too. And I think of Esau over here in Hebrews chapter 12. And in verse 17, Esau <clears throat> 
for you know that afterward, what Esau in verse 16, now 17, you, for you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, that uh, uh, he was rejected, uh, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Well, Esau was a worldly person. He didn't have any spiritual insights. All he thought about was the here and now. And his birthright with all, with all of the religious privileges that came with it meant nothing to him apart from a momentary appetite. And, and for that, he was willing to let it go. But he wanted Jacob's blessing, Isaac's blessing rather, so badly that he would scream for it. And, he, he, and as the text says here, there was no place for repentance. In other words, Esau could not turn things around. As far as Isaac's blessing Jacob rather than him, he couldn't change the situation. So he comes to the end of it with regrets. All right? That's his story. And I use him simply as an example tonight. We're not alone in this matter. And you're sitting tonight with people who are like you in many respects. Uh, they've been there. Second thing that I want us to notice in our passage tonight is not to live in the past. Let's go back to verse 13. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. All right? There's the future element of it. So don't live in the past. I know it's impossible to forget the past, but don't live in the past and don't let the misdeeds of the past rob you of the opportunities that you have now to blossom and to grow and to put down roots. Don't let it rob you. So don't look back. And I like the way Paul expresses it here. How easy would it be for us to look back? Young people, when you were disobedient to parents, to look back, you'll regret that one day. And if you live long enough, it'll tear at your heart. And if you have disdain for authority, you look back, it'll tear you up. It will wring you out with regret. And if you're overtaken with envy and jealousy in your heart toward others, it'll kill you. So don't look back. I mean, we've all been here and done these things, but the past will haunt us in many ways if we allow it to haunt us. And many times our past haunts us because we haven't come clean. That is, we haven't repented of it and stepped away from it and accepted God's forgiveness for it. Consequently, it never lets you uh, go. So the second thing that comes out here in Paul's words is don't live in the past. And the third thing that comes out is learn from that past. If we're smart enough to learn from the mistakes and the misdeeds and the sins of the past, then that will allow us to do exactly as the apostle writes here in verse 14, and say, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So you have something to look forward to. So press on with things that matter. And if you are intent on looking back, look back at some of the things that might help you in pressing on. The good things that are there. For example, every soul that you may have led to the Lord through your influence, through your efforts to bring them to church, through your efforts to try to teach them, every soul that you've ever brought to the Lord, then be grateful for that and seek out opportunities to do more. Everyone that you've ever brought to be restored in Christ, good thing. 
I know they're grateful for it. You be grateful for the same thing. The children that you brought into this world that are following in your footsteps as we've witnessed here tonight. And be grateful for that. And I, I know and I understand that some have children that have, have gone the way of the world and it, and it tears your heart out. And you wring your hands and you cry and you scream and there's not a whole lot you can do for it except talk to them. Be the kind and gentle spirit that you are. And every time you have an opportunity to speak the truth from God's word, do so. And as you look back and you uh, assess your life, think about the changes that you've made over the years, the attitudes that used to be there that aren't there anymore, the, the bad attitudes I'm talking about, and the dispositions and the ideas and the habits that you've overcome. You've quit that nasty stuff. And you can look back and be glad that you have. And then you can also be glad that you're walking in the light of God's word and through all the dark times. And there are plenty of dark times in life. And those dark times may in, involve physical disability, hardships, aches, pains, your body falling apart as it were, your life falling apart. But there's no shame in admitting, you know what, I've made mistakes. I've done things wrong. But God's forgiveness is real. And I'll take hold of it. Because I need it. And I want to come to the end of my life without serious regrets. Now, there, there's no reason to allow the past to haunt you. Because of the opportunities that we have to have that past taken care of. Sorrow never comes too late and happiness never comes too early. And I think the Apostle Paul in just two verses right here covers for us what that means. To have no serious regrets when we come to the end of it all. And nobody knows when that's going to be. But all along the way, you're working, you're striving, you're praying, and you're changing. So that those serious regrets, whatever they may be, will be few. And with God's help, you'll handle it. Let's strive best of our ability to uh, work and labor and love through this life so that we have no serious regrets at the end of it all. And again, I don't forget God's mercy and I don't forget His grace because I know it's there. And I know that God will help me through all.